Uh, Pananda, good afternoon everybody. I'm Colin Rudin. I'm Vice Chancellor of uh, Cardiff University. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, today's event. What we're looking at today is um, not just the impact of coronavirus on future, but, but that as well, uh, but particularly how Welsh institutions, including um, universities, can help shape the post COVID landscape as part of our wider uh, civic mission. The event actually uh, also marks the signing of a memorandum of understanding between Cardiff University and uh, the, um, future, the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner. Now, this is work that has started long before COVID because uh, notice we are a university and Wales is very fortunate to have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act uh, 2015, which is very unusual and admired around the world. And what the university is about, if not future generations, whether we're talking about the research we do that will benefit generations of the future and improve the world, and, and, and COVID has really taught us about that, or teaching, where we're training and educating the uh, generations of uh, the future. Um, so I feel that uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for us as a university to work with the commissioner and with the commissioner's office to help provide uh, um, uh, research expertise and of course the, the commissioner and her office can provide policy expertise and connections which will help us to have greater impact. Our work is going to focus on thematic pillars that's procurement planning and affordable housing with a cross-cutting theme of skills um, and, and the aim really is commissioner deliver against the aims of the well-being of future generations act. Uh, I know Sophie will be saying more about this in a moment but um, uh, for the moment, that's it's very, very important to us to, to do this work and to work in line with the uh, SDGs as well. I just want to uh, introduce our, our panel, um, as well as Sophie Howe, who I'm sure you know, uh, the Future Generations Commission for Wales. We also uh, work with Miles MS, the Welsh Government's Council General, and, the, and uh, their lead on post COVID recovery as well. Um, as the, uh, uh, the uh, Minister for European Transition. So Jeremy's got two hospital passes there, I'm afraid. Um, and we have uh, also Becky Ricketts, um, uh, President of NUS Wales, and Professor Calvin Jones, who's uh, uh, from our own business school. He's Deputy Dean for Public Value and Externations and has been working closely with the uh, Commissioner's Office. So I'm going to ask um, our panel in a moment to each give a, a short presentation um, and then there will be an opportunity to respond to the questions that you're able to uh, 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 submit through the Q&A feature. But before we do that, I'm going to um, ask uh, the Commissioner Sophie Howe um, to say a few words of introduction, introduction as well, please. Thank you, Colin. It's lovely to um, to be with you, and and of course, this um, sort of virtual signing of the um, the MOU is really um, supporting um, or putting the bureaucracy in place of a really good working relationship that has already um, has already been formed. Um, I guess um, you know I have advantages from us working together as someone who has worked. Um, for most of my career in kind of um, public policy, it's often frustrated me. It was a frustration of academics too that policy making appears to be done sometimes on the hoof without kind of um, appropriate input of, of academic. And from the other side, policy makers are frustrated that um, we can't access um, in a in a kind of an, an easily accessible form the best advice from the best um, brains and best um, academics. Um, uh, you know, in our in our local communities and indeed um, indeed beyond. That was really um, the beginning of the MOU, which was um, I've got a big um, agenda and a big task. Um, future generation, pretty much all policy areas, um, the whole population of Wales now, and everyone who isn't born yet. So you know, no um, no pressure there. Um, and I need to be able to access. Um, the best information and the best evidence, but I need to be able to do that um, in in an easy way. And you know, sometimes I've referred to university 
arts and wizardry because trying to find out um, what goes on in them and who does what and who's the right person to speak to and whether there's already been some research or work done on a particular um, theme or topic um, is really quite challenging. Um, and so that's where the conversation started. How do we sort of come together to try and break down those, um, those, those boundaries, focus on a few um, particular things, um, procurement skills, affordable housing um, and planning to sort of develop this um, this relationship and I think you know it's testament to the um, you know to the university's contribution to um, you know civil public and um, political life in Wales that you're willing um, you're willing to do this um, it's also testament to the, the fact that um, some of the driving forces around this have been um, the business school who I believe is still the only public value business school um, in the world so um, that speaks really to Generations Act which is this um, beyond economic growth so to have a business school which is not just teaching the economics of old uh, economics how economics fits with um, within planetary boundaries but is actually living and breathing that um, in the way it conducts its own business is critically um, important I also think that um, for both of us um, you know your I think when your students um, and so on um, opportunities for real life testing because sometimes you can come up with a theory of something you can come up with the best evidence but unless you're able to actually um, apply that in a real life scenario um, it often doesn't um, it often doesn't work and we've seen loads of examples already um, where um, we're making a real impact through placements that have come from university in my office focusing on how do we um, embed the future generations act in the way that city deals are doing um, their business. Um, we have a big programme of work around procurement um, now with one of, your, um, one of your students and one of your professors. Um, we've had some uh, placements from the, the law school. Um, and I think that, you know, that's incredibly important. Um, I think the other thing that works really well is um, the challenge around integrated thinking and working. Because again, like um, every organisation, um, academia can work in and we really need to try and break down those silos. So I think perhaps the challenge for me and the Future Generations Act is um, when I'm working um, with you, um, actually, how are we going to do that um, in a way which isn't just focusing on one narrow area, but seeks opportunities to maximise um, impact across all aspects of it. So delighted to be signing this MOU um, with you, already making impact, and um, I think we have a lot more to do as well. Thanks very much indeed, Sophie, and absolutely I endorse uh, everything you've said there, especially the value of the partnership, I think, to both sides. It is very much... Uh, uh, of mutual benefit and I hope people of Wales and future generations and I'm sure that's the case. So we now come to the um, panellists and uh, I, I, I will ask, I'm going to ask uh, Jeremy to start off and then hand on into, into each of the panellists until we've heard more of them. So please Jeremy. Uh, Colin thank you, thanks for the invitation to speak today and to participate in this panel discussion um, on obviously what is a vital topic. As you were saying um, in dealing with the planning and coordination of our response to both Brexit and COVID is uh, perhaps a, a, a particularly unique opportunity, if I could put it in those terms. But I, I would also say that actually, although we have these two huge, um, you know, adverse forces in our lives, we have, you know, one common future, really. So it's important to be able to see these things in their compound uh, effect, if you like. Um, just two things I think are very clear about COVID in particular. The first is that um, plainly it has impact on all aspects of all our lives. But the other thing I think which is clear is that the burden of it and the impact it has had have not been uh, evenly borne, if you like, it not been evenly felt. Uh, and there are, you know, particular cohorts of people in our country who are bearing. Particular part of that burden, and I think um, young people are certainly one of those cohorts. Um, and so, managing our recovery in a way that makes impact and supports the groups of people who are hardest hit uh, is going to be a key priority for us as a government. And I, in doing that, I'm very keen um, to engage really in a you know a national conversation, if you like, on on these issues. So I'm looking forward to hearing what people have to say today. Um, I think. 
working that I think we have been able to uh, adopt, you know, to the extent possible, an evidence-led approach to how we've been tackling the crisis. And I am heartened, needless to say, by the way that people have been responding to, to it uh, across Wales. I think we've seen um, outpourings of, uh, uh, you know, volunteering, of uh, strength in our communities, um, and in uh, agility and nimbleness in responding to some of these challenges in some really quite profound ways, actually. And I think that's actually from adversity, if you like, um, is very positive. Um, and I think that stands us in, in maintain those uh, responses as we look forward to the next sort of stage of how we respond to the COVID crisis. But I think we need to be very clear, if we're not already, um, that the reality is that we're still battling it. And, you know, we see announcements on a daily basis, in particular over the course, which I think uh, are reminders to us very much uh, of that. Um, but I think alongside the response, uh, you know, on that daily level, we need to think ahead and have been thinking ahead about how we want to you know, build on what we have learned. And I use the term reconstruction um, because I think that you know, we don't want to, uh, I don't think we are, but I don't want to foster this idea that what lies ahead is simply, as it were, returning to normal because you know, for many people, normal wasn't a good thing in any, in any case. Um, you know, as I was saying at the start, you know, we, we are facing very real and uh, social and economic consequences at the moment, but we're also looking at the challenges from other sources. So, you know, the end of the transition period uh, is a huge, uh, a huge, a huge presence in our lives. It increasingly looks like we will leave without a deal. Um, there are no questions, I would say, around devolution and what the UK government's uh, recent actions mean for Wales. Uh, the climate emergency is uh, an organising for all our lives and will certainly require a uh, very profound shift, clearly, in the way that we um, live and work into the future. And all of those uh, come together, in a sense, uh, in terms of time and impact. And what we must not do is allow the costs of those combined challenges to be borne by uh, by future generations uh, and to fall unfairly on those uh, on those people uh, and I think you know the act embodies our commitment I would say to to, to reflecting uh, the interests not simply of here and now but of uh, the future in how we respond to all of those uh, challenges um, as I was saying at the start clearly we already know that uh, young people have been very very seriously impacted by uh, the virus in the context of um, disrupted education, but also uh, in the context of challenges to uh, mental health and well-being in the context of uh, prolonged lockdown. Um, and, you know, young people who are in work uh, are more likely to be in sectors that have been seriously impacted, um, like tourism, hospitality and the gig economy. And obviously, they're often also sectors where uh, the working conditions aren't um, aren't ones we would want to see in any case. Um, for young people entering the job market for the first time, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but um, they are facing a situation where obviously fewer jobs uh, and you know more unemployed people to compete with. So uh, you know, very, very alive in the work that we've been doing, that this is the time to reaffirm, reaffirm our commitment from a, a future generations perspective. And also that in particular perhaps in the week in the months ahead as we recover from COVID we do that you know with a values-based recovery which is the phrase we've been using ourselves internally in the government um, so we've already been doing um, there's a process that I've been leading which I'm happy to talk about if anyone has questions uh, Colin uh, to try and understand what lies ahead and how we can best uh, prepare for that uh, and uh, a number of uh, people who are participating in the discussion today have been part of those discussions, so I'm grateful for that. Um, but we've already, for example, committed to providing uh, specific and dedicated advice for further education leavers, as well as extra funding for traineeships and uh, with a special focus on apprenticeships for young people. Uh, the REACT reskilling grant uh, and wage subsidy programme will be providing specific, you know, support for employers, obviously, but, you know, we hope that will give them confidence to hire young people as part of that mix. 
the Working Wales website, which provides uh, gu guidance, obviously, on finding work, uh, has been updated so that there's a one-stop shop, effectively, for young people recognising the particular challenges that young people will face entering the job market. Um, and uh, we will continue to support the Jobs Growth Wales programme uh, to ensure that you know, young people get as much support as they, uh, as they can from that as well. Um, and then in some of the ways in which we are responding in the future, you know, looking forward, if you wish, um, you know, many of the interventions that uh, you will see from us, I think, are around uh, the priorities that we've already been working on, which are, you know, climate change, education that offers real opportunities, affordable housing. Um, I think there's a significant uh, opportunity, but also, you know, ch ch challenge, if you like, ahead in that space. Um, and then uh, significant challenges in the transport system. But again, some of the things we've learned in the last few weeks and months have presented, um, you know, a route map uh, to, to providing that service in a more uh, bluntly, more effective way, I think, right across Wales. So there are a number of areas which, you know, we, I think you will see um, initiatives coming forward in that space. Um, and in the work that I've been doing, both with, um, you know, experts in Wales, but also in other parts of the UK and indeed internationally, and, you know, organisations, delivering frontline services for example across Wales what has been a very very consistent theme throughout all of that is the issue of intergenerational equity and the challenge to us really as a government to see everything that we do you know in the months ahead as we respond through that lens and certainly and I've been working in particular over the last few weeks to prioritize and reprioritize um, certainly what we will be doing for the rest of this Senate term through through that lens um, so later this month i'm meeting with the um, future generations leadership academy actually to speak with uh some young people there i think 20 or 30 young people who um sophie has kindly arranged for me to be able to speak with uh to hear obviously thoughts and ideas um they will have um just because you know we, we think it's very important to have a kind of a very open um approach to this and to be open to challenge as well as um to be hearing that we're doing some things which are right, hopefully. Um, so uh, I, I won't say, I think, much more about uh, that, simply to say, uh, just to reaffirm the point that we recognise that, you know, in all of those areas that I mentioned as challenges earlier, uh, I think the response that we have needs to reflect the values of the Act and our commitment to, and I think, you know, as well as seeing that as a statutory framework, it is going to lead to us making better decisions uh, across those whole range of areas. So um, we'll it there and happy to take uh, take part in the conversation and take questions down the line. Um, and I think it's my task now uh, to hand over to Sophie Howe. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, and, you know, I was saying to you earlier, I think you've got possibly the toughest portfolio of any um, minister anywhere with um, COVID recovery and Brexit in, in one. So um, the sleepless nights you must be having must be um, beyond belief. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think that um, I'm a glass um, half full kind of person. So I suppose my starting point is um, never waste a good crisis. I think there are, a, you know, whilst there are some huge, huge challenges, um, both in dealing with the immediacy of COVID um, and the aftermath, there are also a huge number of, um, of opportunities. But I think we have to set those opportunities within the context um, of some broader thinking around, you know, what let's what might be coming down um, the line at us as well. And as um, Jeremy just said, make sure that we are focusing on that sort of intergenerational um, equity. So as challenging as COVID is, um, I think potentially um, it's a dress rehearsal for climate change. Um, if we think that our economy is um, in a bad place now, um, it will be in an even worse place if we do not um, reduce our carbon emissions and do not um, take the appropriate steps that we need to take to tackle climate change. Um, I've been pleased to see that in the last um, two years in particular, the government are um, investing more in um, in, in climate change directly in terms of climate and nature emergency, but there's a huge amount more to be done. So any programs um, or investment that comes on of trying to um, rebuild um, post-COVID needs to absolutely be tackling climate change um, in, in the same breath, if you like. 
Um, inequality, you know, we talk a lot about the way that COVID has exposed inequality. Um, and for me, um, it's a bit like climate change in that um, suddenly we're all talking about it. Um, and actually, you know, we've known about it for a long time. We've known that there are um, these huge inequalities in society. And we've just chosen, I suppose, not to do enough about it. Like climate change, um, we haven't done enough about that. We've put more carbon into the atmosphere um, since Al Gore published his in, in, um, Inconvenient Truth um, than at any time prior to that. So we can't say that we didn't know. Um, we have been taking conscious decisions to do the wrong things. Um, you can't be allowed to, um, to continue. So I think this kind of concept of build back better is the wrong concept and um, build back better suggests that we should just do the same things that we've been doing um, a bit better. Actually, I just think we should be doing better things um, altogether. And um, what's really encouraging, I think, is there's a consensus emerging um, across Wales around what those better things um, might be. And back in May, um, I published a, a five point plan around COVID recovery. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that the government's sort of narrative and the government's own approach um, so far in terms of COVID recovery is very much um, reflecting um, that five point plan, which was focused around um, tackling climate change, um, making sure that the right people get the right skills and that's tackling um, equality and um, making sure we're reducing our carbon emissions and using opportunities to restore nature um, and so on. So I think, as I said, the, um, there is a um, emerging. Um, it's been really interesting to see that significant shift in narrative in the government. I think, you know, we've had the Future Generations Act. Um, since um, 20, well, 2016, it came into force. If I'm honest, the first um, few years, I don't think the government were taking um, it seriously. Um, but now, looking at the way that narrative and policy is developing, I was looking at an economic, um, one of the economic strategies um, coming from government um, just yesterday, um, which talks about their mission being around a well-being economy, which is resilient, green and just. Um, and that absolutely kind of speaks to the um, to the future generation. I think the big challenge for us now is um, let's take part that we've got this consensus emerging about the things, the sorts of things that we should be doing. I think the challenge is how do we go about doing those things? So there's a consensus emerging that um, retrofitting energy efficiency measures into our homes is a no-brainer. Um, it helps to put money back into people's pockets by taking them out of fuel poverty. It helps to keep people out of hospital through living in damp um, and um, it can help to create jobs um, in the foundational economy and it helps us to reduce our carbon emissions. There's nothing not, not to love there, but how we go about doing that and taking that policy forward will be absolutely critical. And how we do that in a way which aims to um, meet as well as many of our well-being priorities possible will be crucial. So the jobs that hopefully will be created through that sort of investment, are they going to go to white middle-aged men or are they also going to be tackling inequality by targeting and um, Bain communities and um, disabled people and um, those firms from the labour market young people um, and so on um, I think that there's um, you know this we've seen a lot of disruption um, as a result of um, of Covid but we need to see further disruption and I think we need some um, to bring some unusual suspects and um, deep thinking into the way that we do things so we can ensure that as I said we're not just sort of building back better but we're actually doing um, better things um, I often talk about the Future Generations Act as being the biggest cultural change programme um, that Wales has ever seen, if we get it right. Um, and we can't just rely on um, high level policy aspirations with a bit of funding to actually change what is happening in the day to day decision making on how things are taken forward um, across Wales. So there has to be this disruption in terms of this um, and in terms of our culture as well. And to do that, as I said, I think we need to bring in um, some different ideas. Years. One of the things that I've been proposing is how do you help to um, bring creative thinking into how we plan, design and build our infrastructure in terms of how we think about rebuilding our town, uh, town and city centres post-Covid. Um, what about all of our creative and cultural professionals um, out there who could have a really important um, impact? Um, in changing some of the thinking there. How do we bring them into the, um, into the picture? Because if we just go back 
to the old practice of town planners and regeneration um, experts, if you like, coming into those discussions, you will just get more of the same thing. We need to be bringing in um, different voices um, into how we actually go about doing things. I think we also need to be thinking about um, where the radical solutions might be, which have multiple um, benefits. So a reduced working week, for example, I think a reduced working week could have a significant impact um, as a next phase of, um, of furlough. Um, if, if the UK government were to take that forward, um, it could also in the long term have a significant impact on people's well-being, potentially giving them more time to spend in their communities, building on the volunteering and the community spirit that we've seen during COVID um, and so on. How do we make sure that we're retaining the benefits from home working um, in terms of reduction in carbon emissions, um, in terms of the ability of people who perhaps couldn't access jobs previously to be able now to access those jobs? How do we make sure that the gains that we've seen in the health service um, where we've got, you know, where they've gone digital, they're able to see patients um, more, um, uh, more patients because they're, they're being more efficient. How do we make sure that we're not just doing, taking that forward in a way um, which enables doctors to just see more patients, but actually perhaps gives them the c capacity and the time to be thinking holistically about the patient um, in front of them, rather than just treating more and more people um, with medication and uh, operations and so on. So I think it does need this kind of quite disruptive thinking. I think we need um, ideas on how we can do things differently. Um, as I said, I think the consensus on the sorts of things we should be doing is there, but we really need um, those ideas coming from a wide people, um, including I'm sure many uh, people who were watching this, um, this webinar um, to really um, take us forward um, in a way which maximizes um, well-being and takes into account the interests of future generations. I think, sorry, I am passing um, on to Becky now. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your previous contributions. Um, and thank you to Cardiff University for inviting me to speak at this event. Um, you know, in any debate about future generations, you know, I think it's really important that we have a voice that represents young people. So, yeah, I'm grateful to have the opportunity. Um, I think this is quite a, an interesting and quite a timely question to be considering at the moment. You know, it's, no, I don't think anybody on this panel can fully answer the question at the moment um, because we simply don't know really what the term impacts are, are going to be. Um, we don't know how long it's going to be until we get a vaccine or even if, even if we will get a vaccine at all. Um, and we don't yet understand the long term implications of, of COVID. Um, I think what we do know, though, is that we're already currently in a recession, the biggest we've currently ever faced, and it's going to require a huge amount of effort to recover from that. Um, you know, I think the question that we've been posed was be a difficult one, you know, even if COVID was the only existential threat that we were facing, um, but obviously we know it isn't. Um, obviously, we've heard about Brexit and the limitations of young people's opportunities. We've heard about the exposure of societal inequality, as well as a small matter of the climate emergency, which we know we need to act on urgently. Um, I suppose I'm the voice of the young people on this panel, um, and we need to listen to young people on the need for real urgent action on climate change. So uh, there are multiple challenges that we're facing, I think, in kind of the short, the medium and the long term. Um, really, now is the time that we ought to be thinking about this radically, as scary a word as that might sound to some people. Um, I've heard talks about the need to return to austerity in the face of the COVID crisis. But I don't think that society or the planet, for that matter, really can cope with another 10 or 15 years of austerity and that business of usual thinking that we've heard quite a lot about. We need real investment, green, sustainable investment to change things for Wales for the better. Simply passing the buck to young people and future generations is just not good enough. It's also changing about how we think about investment. We need to be thinking more about who we invest in and less about what we invest in. Um, to me, it's pretty simple. If we want to stop future generations from paying the price of COVID-19, then we need to invest in those future generations. We need to give them the skills and the resources through education and opportunities to deal with the wider implications of the pandemic, whatever they might turn out to be. So obviously in Wales, we're really lucky and we do have mechanisms that are encouraging us to change. 
Um, obviously, as we said, the Wellbeing of Future Generations 2015 is a brilliant place to start for us here in Wales. And putting the onus on public bodies and just individuals to consider future generations in the decisions they make really promotes that sort of thinking. Um, we're still in the act's pretty early days, but it means for me that here in Wales we have a tool that is genuinely unique um, and ensures that our public services are forward thinking, which is so important in the face of a pandemic. Um, and obviously it's great to see that Cardiff University, one of our leading universities, um, signing this memorandum with the Future Generations Commissioner. Um, for me, you know, a really positive message about the role of our education institutions in all of this, who we know have a part to play. Um, and for me, investment in those education systems, more crucially, investment in the people who benefit from those education systems need to be a major focus in this decade way beyond. Um, obviously we know it was the NHS that saved us from the COVID health crisis months ago in, and it's education that can save us from the echoes. Um, but if we want education to be that saviour and the saviour that we know it can be, um, I think that we need to think very differently about how we do education to make it work for everyone. Um, in Wales, we're lucky in the sense that we have the most progressive system in the UK in terms of finances. We don't load the poorest students with the most debt as happens elsewhere in, in the UK and across the world. Ultimately, a system charging fees we know isn't sustainable for students or for institutions. The COVID crisis has demonstrated that as we've seen. Universities have faced real financial difficulties because of the loss of international students and international fees due to the pandemic. And I think that that really comes as a consequence of viewing students as just units of profit. That's not the fault of universities by any stretch of the imagination. It's the fault of a system that has become increasingly So with my NUS student activist hat on, um, what students really want is investment in a free, accessible and liberated education system. They want investment in schools and colleges, universities, undertaking apprenticeships, adult learning, because I, we often forget that students are not just 18 to 25 students. You know, we've got students that are parents, that are mature, that are carers, um, and, if, and we want to see a truly accessible education system for everyone you know, young or old, poor, black and white, it, it has to be accessible for everybody in our society. Students want to see kind of the universities, the public bodies and their wider society to be thinking more sustainably and with future generations. Um, you know, they want to see investment in mental health services, mental health resources, not just on their campuses, but in their communities as well. You know, the mental health implications of COVID are well rehearsed by now, as you probably heard. Um, but there's a very real possibility still of intergenerational trauma that future generations will be focused on, will be burdened with way after this crisis is over. Um, so I think what I've described there is kind of a vision shared by so many young people and not just young Wales. Um, obviously, we realise that it's not a vision that can be achieved overnight by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but our current situation has presented an opportunity to start considering the more the more radical steps that we can take to make our country fairer for all of our future generations. Um, obviously, we've also got an election next year in which our 16 and 17 year olds will be able to vote for the very first time. And I think we've seen in the last few months that these people are really starting to find their voice. You know, they're striking for the climate, they're rallying against their unfair exam algorithms, they're proudly saying that black lives matter to them. Those young people are clearly hungry and can be desperate for change and they know that it is needed in their society as well. So to kind of sum it up, I think, we need to listen to young people and take urgent action on their behalf, not just giving them a seat at the table, but giving them a megaphone while they're... You know, now is the real time for politicians and political parties and anyone else who is listening on this webinar to really think bigger about what we need for society and their constituents to make sure that Wales is fair and equitable and good for our future generations. So that is, I'm going to now pass over to our wonderful Professor Calvin Jones. Wonderful, you haven't heard me yet. Uh, thanks Becky. Um, I, 
I mean, I don't think I disagree with a single word that any of the speakers has, um, has said. A number of themes I think are really important that have been um, surfaced there. I'm not going to lay things around equality um, uh, and inclusivity, particularly in, in terms of generational aspects. Um, but what I would say is, is, is that we, you know, I mean, I mean Becky using the word radical there, um, we, we need a version of radical that we've not seen in Wales for 150 years, probably, if we're going to do this properly. Uh, I, I, I've said to Jeremy in a, in a, in a different meeting uh, on post-COVID recovery that if, if you have an economy and the incentives and structures and taxes and the way we do things is more or less the same as the UK, then your outcomes are more or less the same as the UK. A little bit different here and there, but really, you know, um, uh, it will be much different. And we can see that the way the UK is going, that's just not good enough. And so if we are going to reconfigure, reconstruct, rebuild, uh, do differently, then we need genuine differences in the ways that things happen on the ground. Uh, two or three things occurred to me. The first is that our tax system needs to really push activities that we think are important. We are talking about uh, resilience, uh, which is, uh, I think, a very important concept to go forward with rather than the kind of uh, the best value or lowest cost. We've, we've adopted for many services in the past. Then we need to be able to build resilience to our systems. As part of that resilience, uh, we need to decentralize uh, and, and rebuild town centers. Then we need to worry about why it is that parking at a big test goes out of town is free and parking in the middle of the town isn't. Uh, and, and with the existing advantages that the big superstores have already, how we are layering even more advantage um, with our with our different planning regulatory and other systems, uh, which which is a real problem. I think my my special concern with the way that we we we're undertaking this 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 post COVID reconstruction is that we're talking about what things you might do differently, um, and the objectives very welcomely, and you might have that are different in terms of economic growth versus well being, but we're not talking about changing any structures. Uh, you know, it seems to me that the Welsh Government, local authorities, universities, health boards expect and intend to come through this crisis pretty much exactly the same as they were in 2019, uh, imagining that somehow the structures were relevant in 2020, 2021, That's probably not right. Um, and I, I wrote something um, five years ago suggesting that it was futile trying to build a Welsh economy. And what you need to do is try and build at least five or six Welsh economies. Um, because the economy of South West Wales um, will be very different to that of North East Wales and South East Wales. And you can't hope really to, to manage them in the same way. And I think COVID has, uh, has reinforced my view on that, that, that whatever happens in terms of responses to both COVID and whatever challenges come forward, uh, the climate and, and nature emergencies, obviously, they will have to come from there. And our current system of, of centralisation in Cardiff Bay doesn't allow us to learn from from people doing good things on the ground, and that's a, that's a net. I think it's going to be really important to grasp, probably for the government after this one. I don't know what Chairman will be doing in summer twenty twenty one. Hopefully not this, but you know, with his own mental health. Um, but um, you know, uh, whoever whoever in, in twenty through twenty twenty one in in whatever a post election government looks like has to grasp the net that people are disinterested. I'm just writing the paper at the moment on 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 attitudes in former coal mining areas, politics, and so on. And people have gone, they haven't gone towards Farage necessarily, but they've gone into apathy. And we have to deal with that if we are genuinely um, to think about what, how places can respond and become vibrant post-COVID. And finally, then I'll come to the kind of other uh, element, which, you know, Beck obviously talk about quite a lot, which is the role of universities. Uh, it, it, a piece of work I did last year with Sophie looked at, looked at how schools are, are building for the future. Um, and, and we never got around to doing a post-16 version of that. But it does strike me in parallel to the analysis we took then uh, that we have a situation in universities, and particularly in, in, in what you might call um, elite universities, of which we come Cardiff as one, um, where we are accrediting kids to do things which look very old-fashioned. Accountancy uh, looks a very old-fashioned thing to be doing a degree in, frankly, uh, in the current um, day and age. Economics, uh, even we are trying to change it in the way we teach it in our business school, it looks a very old fashioned thing to be doing. If you wanted to do a degree in community activism, if you want to do a degree in placemaking or, or a degree in um, holistic carbon management, you would struggle in any of Britain's universities to do that. And that's, that's a real problem. Uh, and somehow we have to 
obviously with a partnership of, of, of the current and any future uh, Ministers for Education in Wales, think about how we genuinely move the oil education around to much more closely align to uh, to the needs of Wales society going forward. I'm not an, an advocate of, of, of training people in education to become good workers. I think that's really dangerous. Uh, the drift in the UK is towards even more of that, and I, that really worries me. To build an education system that trains um, citizens, of, citizens of tomorrow, uh, both school for education and then higher education. Um, we've got all the tools of that in Wales, um, and we can start doing it tomorrow. Um, I don't see why we don't. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll hand back now, I think, to Colin to summarise. That's great. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, uh, all of you, for those um, fascinating uh, contributions. We, we've got about um, 15 minutes, and we've had a few uh, uh, questions in. Just one more uh, come there. Uh, what I've noticed coming through uh, is both the questions and indeed some of the uh, commentary that we've heard from the from the panelists um, some, some key themes clearly and, and one of those is climate change and environment um, another is education and skills and upskilling um, another qu quite related to that is um, people clearly this is about it's about as Becky so eloquently put it you know, this is about young people and future generations and how are, how is their voice heard not just their voice heard how do they actually affect change um, in, in society? And there's, a, there's another interesting one actually that came up in, in, in the questions and the, those uh, Ed to, uh, to have a look at those in a moment to stop to coming quite fast. Um, but uh, it is dangers of isolationism and this actually links very much with some, some of what Jeremy was talking about, you know, the, the sort of um, uh, event of Covid and of Brexit at the same time, that there are ways in which both of those can militate against international collaboration or they could do the opposite. So, you know, individual isolation in terms of mental health issues, but also isolation of us as a nation um, uh, in Wales and, and in the UK. So, things there. I think one, probably the one that, that came through initially quite strongly was, was climate change. And we do have this situation where COVID appears to be accelerating existing developments, you know, the, the, the sort of demise of the high street, um, uh, uh, shift, shifting to, to low, actually make that operate by, by what we're doing now, for example. Um, any, any thoughts from the panel on how we are uh, tackling that, you know, the, this kind of long-standing, there's a question there specifically about economic growth versus the environment, a long-standing issue that we've known about for the last 50 years. Who would like to come in on that initially? Just unmute yourself if you would. It's sort of opposite of buzzing. Jeremy. Well, I mean, just to say, the work that I've been doing, uh, you know, in terms of coordinating our response has been based on three pillars. And one of the three pillars is environmental justice, because, you know, what we are very alive to is that there will be um, despite the fact that we don't think that the right thing is that we're back to normal, or there'll be quite a strong tendency for many people just to want that to happen, which is a sort of on one level an understandable uh, instinct. But you know, we do not want a tension to develop between you know stimulating the economy on the one hand and adhering to principles of sustainability on the other. And there's a kind of obvious risk that that develops as a public narrative. It seems to it seems to us so. Um, so, you know, there's some practical things, though, in this space, which are, you know, you know um, tangible demonstrations, really, of, of, that, of that approach. So, you know, when we look at uh, investment for stimulus, there's a huge opportunity around uh, green housing. Sophie mentioned energy upgrades housing. There's a massive opportunity there. There's a responsibility, really, in terms of business support in the, in the future to focus on support for businesses that are transitioning into a more sustainable model or decarbonizing um so there's kind of very practical things which you know are the long-term objectives but they they can be implemented in the here and now obviously and you'll have seen some of i think already you know we try to capture the moment really around people working from home and not using their 
cast so much with in, in public transit with investment in active travel um, and the stuff we've been talking about in the last few days about working from home I think it was Calvin that was saying you know there's a centers well so I think working from home is great if you can work from home but actually it's not great for everybody even if you've got the kind of job that enables that to happen but it would be great for me if I could you know commute occasionally from uh, Ruval to Neath rather than Ruval to Cardiff Bay you know so there's an opportunity repurposing some of these empty commercial spaces in our town centres to make those hubs where people come together but to work remotely from their own individual workplaces. I mean, some of these things in a sense are, I think someone used the word no-brainer earlier, uh, you know, so those are, you know, physical, tangible uh, actions which we can take which makes some of this change in at a point when there's still an opportunity to do that, really. Absolutely. Sophie? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, Jeremy's points about um, investment are um, really crucial, but we need to be looking at investment, not just in terms of the new investment um, that will hopefully come but what we're actually doing, um, you know, in the, the sort of day-to-day -day job as well. So one of the challenges that I've issued to government is, on the one hand, you've increased your direct spending to tackle climate change. On the other hand, about 70% of what you spend on transport goes on roads. So you kind of undermine your own um, position by not getting a grip in that area. So I know, you know, the business of government is really difficult and this is about kind of culture change and it's about forensically going into, you know, each department and each area and making sure that the policy narrative and priorities that the government has set in are actually playing out in practice in those areas. And that's really difficult to do. I've been having some conversations with um, Lee Walters recently who I'm really impressed with in the fact that he is getting into the detail of why is procurement not working? What are the barriers? There's no point in us producing another procurement which will say all the, the right things if actually we're not getting into the kind of nitty gritty of it. And that's where I think that potentially, you know, it, you know, in reality, the Welsh government have a tiny number of civil servants and officials to actually deliver this stuff. And that's where I think that we could all be part of this sort of Team Wales civic mission you want to call it in actually getting alongside government to try and work some of this to work some of this um through i also want to pick up on the points around um looking at um sort of baking in the um the benefits or however you want to describe it um and i think that in everything we should be doing um looking at both the what we do but then how we do it how we go about doing things can either have one singular benefit so um you know if you think about um how would we decarbonize our transportation system we could put all of our eggs in an electric vehicle basket um, and that would have on decarbonizing our transportation system however when you apply a broader range of well-being metrics to that what you find is actually that's the wrong that will do is have us all sit in um, in our electric vehicles rather than our diesel vehicles um, not walking not being healthy um, and so on it will have us um, uh, it, it will not tackle um, inequalities that exist because um, the people who weren't able to afford diesel to afford electric vehicles so the point that I'm trying to make is that everything every time we go about doing something we have to look at what Across this wide range of well-being goals and well-being metrics and let's find a thing to do that has the biggest contribution to each of them. Thanks very much Sophie and some, some really interesting points there and this sort of working out what this hybrid model is between working from home you know in our case with blended learning you know with part of it in person part of it online is going to be the real challenge for us I think in, in the future and, and suggestions like Jeremy's are perhaps a commuter shortest to a a hub where you've got all the facilities you need and you don't need and, and that eating in the winter you know working from home in the summer is one thing but we haven't really thought through the cost of working from home in the, in, in the winter but i'd like to come on to the questions of, uh, of universities and skills so there's a question around um from Hirel patel there on the role of universities uh, in uh, uh, for delivering new forms of lifelong learning so um calvin has some interesting ideas there about potential degrees one could offer but there are there's all kinds of other things one could be doing to perhaps uh, help help out in, in terms of lifelong learning. 
and really the whole question of upskilling and what is it young people are going to need. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear from Calvin about the role of universities and perhaps from, from Becky really on, on future generations are going to need from the universities in terms of educational uh, opportunity and specifically what kind of training. Uh, should we start with Calvin? Yeah, thanks Colin. Um, I think the, the first thing I'd say is uh, <clears throat> without more institutional flexibility, uh, we can't do anything. And this is this is true not just at Cardiff University, almost all, all universities in the UK, with the exception maybe of OU. Uh, you know, we have to get away from the idea that you do a degree over three or four years in a place. You know, I mean, our university up until now, if you didn't come to Cardiff, you couldn't get a degree. Now, that, now that's no longer going to be true, I suspect, going forward, um, depending on how the pandemic and other things roll out. But the opportunity then is is to um, provide bite-sized module level learning for people remotely um, or in hubs. I, mean, I would be I would be delighted if we ended up with a Cardiff University hub in the valleys where I live and I could just wander down and teach people in my local town. You know, no reason why that couldn't happen particularly. Land is very cheap up here, Colin. Um, this this idea of looking at how you deliver your knowledge in our case um, or that about new knowledge with partners across a wide variety of, of, of platforms, mechanisms, media, uh, in a way which then is resilient to challenge. So if we do get, you know, uh, a, new, a new COVID in two or three years time, we will simply switch seamlessly to a whole online system, which is already there and waiting. Now, of course, the challenge to that is that requires um, in systems and in, you know, institutional capacity. And secondly, it requires to take particular academics with us. And, you know, even in the most progressive business school, I would argue in the UK, if not in Europe, you know, I, I still have some fuddy daddies um, who would really rather just sit in front of a, a, a lecture slide set for two hours and teach and then go home and, and really not think about how their pedagogy and how their approach to learning needs to change. And that, again, you know, not quite in the but that's a culture change you need to start engaging with the university. How, how can we genuinely develop two-way kind of learning experiences, not just with our students, but with our students from first and the grad right through to PhD? Well, and that was COVID as a disruptor that it is. We'll, we'll help make some of that happen. Thanks. Becky. Thanks, Calvin. Um, I think drawing on, on Calvin's last point, actually, um, is quite an important one. I think that that's, that's kind of one of the, the fundamental a lot of students kind of arguing against um, tuition fees, particularly particularly given this year. You know, I think I think there's also kind of recognition in our universities that degrees that we are offering now, um, there will be jobs around in 10, 20 years time that we, you know, don't exist at the moment. And we've got students that now are in our primary school classrooms but in 15 years time will be studying degrees that currently don't exist because, you know, the society that we live in has changed so dramatically. Um, so I think, you know, I think there's, there's kind of a few things that, you know, I think in terms of, in terms of upskilling, um, you know, if you speak to the average person, it's kind of that they have quite a linear view of education. Um, and I think that's only really started to begin to change now, you know, in terms of coming back and retraining. Um, you know, I also, I also kind of agree that there's, you know, if you, if you undertake a degree, it's done in, in three or four years, like Bish Bash Bosh done. Um, and actually kind of the current model of offering education doesn't actually cater you know, life happening in the middle. You know, if somebody does want to come back and retrain and have a degree, um, you know, has a child in the middle um, or, you know, you know, has a severe um, or, you know, kind of any any kind of number of things that can happen like in someone's life. You know, at the moment, the, the kind of education that we have doesn't really account for anything other than quite a rigorous set of three or four years and then do your degree and, and kind of off you go. Um, so I think, I think again, like there's a kind of, kind of think about obviously how, not just kind of what we offer in terms of degrees and look into the future, but also kind of how, how we offer them. We're all very much getting very, getting used to uh, online learning and online education and kind of the, the difficulty and the differences between face-to-face -face and online. That's something that you know, we're all struggling with at the moment in universities. Um, but I think it's also, it's also kind of an opportunity to kind of have a step back and kind of reimagine like, right, okay, obviously we've been delivering lectures in person to the same, you know, in exactly the same way for how, how many years. And obviously now we've had this and so many different elements of society on its head. 
why not do the same with education? Why not look at how we deliver education and look at it like, does it meet the needs of our population? Does it meet the needs of our current students? Does it meet the needs of our staff? You know, it's, it's a real difficulty when, you know, you hear about some universities across the UK that wanted to put in things like Saturday day lectures, knowing that, you know, lecturers and academics are already having to wrestle with, you know, kind of delivering in a very different way. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, there's kind of, there's so many different opportunities here that we can look at and kind of just kind of analyze our current education system and kind of think like, is it, is it currently fit for purpose? And if it's not, how do we, how do we change it so that it doesn't just suit the right here, right now COVID situation, but so it suits, you know, kind of it suits the line as well. Uh, thanks very much, Becky. Um, that there's quite a few, uh, in fact, comments as well on the Q&A, so if people just want to, to, to read those for themselves. We've only got uh, a couple of minutes to go. I, I think it would be interesting to hear from panellists, if we could very, very briefly, uh, final thoughts just on what could the long-term consequences of COVID be? I mean, maybe long-term health consequences. What about you know, mental health in particular? You know, this, this idea of, uh, of isolation, sort of long-term negative consequences and what we could do. That's an awful lot to answer in, in less than a minute each, but if we quickly start, and that has to be going around the same order as before with Jeremy, probably about 30 seconds each. Uh, well, I mean, there's a potential very, very damaging long-term consequences. I think the one that probably keeps me most exercised is the potential impact on young people of periods out of work beyond in their working life. I mean, every piece of evidence we have mm. tells us that you, it's almost impossible to shake off the detrimental impacts of that throughout an entire working life. So the focus one set of interventions is around that, and that's about keeping challenges. What isn't quite so much talked about, I think, because it feels at this point perhaps more indirect, is the long-term consequences of public, financing, public finances across the UK. We are yet to see how that plays out, but I think the, the consequences of that are going to be very serious as well. Thanks very much. Sophie? I mean, I, I don't disagree with Jeremy on the, you know, the, the huge potential for negative um, consequences, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to stay positive and just give a, a, a few sort of flavours of, you know, what could happen. And this is all dependent on how we take decisions, I guess. But, um, you know, just one example, stay in local, home working. Does that mean we're going to be shopping local in our local um, high streets with independent retailers rather than in um, the big corporates in the town and city centre? Does it mean that we're going to be volunteering local? Um, does it mean that we're going to be riding our bikes local um, rather than getting in our cars um, to go to the city centre and so on? So I think um, it's those things where you can see, you know, one change and then the way in which you might, um, you know, uh, facilitate that change further can have more positive impacts um, if we get it right. Thanks very much. And I, I didn't, I, I shouldn't have focused on the negative actually and put Jeremy on, on that line, but it is like, so. Thanks, Colin. Um, I, you know, I think, I think particularly when it comes to mental health, we have a lot more kind of emphasis on the, on the crisis management, the very end point of when, you know, things get too much. And I think that actually, you know, kind of promote good mental health to kind of, you know, encourage people to want to come to university to undertake all of these things that they know they can do, then a lot of the time actually put in the focus kind of those very early touch points when somebody is, you know, on the edge or kind of, you know, worried about their own mental health, they're not turning up to classes enough, they're not, you know, eating right, they're not any, any of these really basic things that we know, you know, are kind of are kind of signals in mental health. And I think that, you know, investment and resources in in kind of that area as well as obviously the point but you know kind of it's it comes back to that prevention is always better than cure and you know i will always say that for for mental health as well um and i think it's also looking at people that are university or just at college you know it starts a lot earlier than that there's obviously kind of investment needed in in kind of children's children's services as well it's not just the minute you get to 18 it's different um so yeah i think i think there's kind of two two big areas there to look at within mental health absolutely Thanks, Becky. And final word from Calvin. Um, thanks, Colin. Yeah, this this is a really difficult question. Um, I, I, was, I was doing I was doing some research yesterday. Um, we were doing some lectures on COVID to our um, 
to our incoming students uh, this month. Um, and I was thinking if you were a blacksmith or a labourer uh, experiencing the Black Death um, in the sort of um, you know, 13, 14 centuries, uh, you, you probably wouldn't be thinking, well, this is pretty terrible, but at least my son will have higher wages and we will eventually develop makers, guilds and unions because we're more scarce in terms of labouring people. Um, and eventually that will lead to, you know, um, unions and all sorts of interesting things. Um, but the problem is that the upper class will try and respond by policing and sheriffs and prisons um, as a result of this newly energised. I mean, it, it would have been really impossible within that pandemic to, to have any sense of the sort of things that would have emerged as a result of the different demographic impacts of, of, um, of the Black Death. So I think, in, you know, we probably can't know what's going to happen. Um, but what we do know is because this pandemic is part of a, a rolling wave of crises on inequality, austerity and climate change and ecological disaster and various other bits and pieces. What we do need is to be flexible and resilient and keep our eye on the prize, which is basically, if we generations act in words, if we, if we carry on doing that and doing that really well, we'll probably be as... Uh... That's great. Well, thanks very much indeed for those uplifting words to finish uh, the session. Uh, enormous thank you to our panellists. I, I found those discussions really fascinating, actually, and it's a great opportunity to think these uh, things through. Thank all of you for attending. I hope you enjoyed it, and that's the end of the session. Thank you.